Uh, my name is Anthony Oskang, and I'm a painter and writer living in Los Angeles. Um, I do a type of art that's called lowbrow, uh, also called pop surrealism. Uh, the reason it's called lowbrow is because the uh, cultural influences that I draw upon are things like skateboarding, surf culture, tattoos, and hot rods. It's sort of uh, cultural manifestations that are looked upon as being lowbrow as opposed to the highbrow, which is things like opera and the symphony and so forth. So, you know, in the fine art world, frequently um, people's influences are within the fine art world itself. This art movement began taking its cultural influences from things outside of the art world. So, um, there was a lot of sort of resistance against the lowbrow art movement, which essentially started uh, probably in the very early 80s in Los Angeles. The first uh, art sub-movement of the lowbrow art movement was custom culture, which had to do with hot rods, hot rod culture. People like Ed Roth, uh, who, who did the famous Rat Fink and customized cars, and the people who worked at his studios, like, like um, Robert Williams and so forth. We were, we were all working together on this, on this sort of cultural endeavor to try and get people to, list, to, to look at this kind of art. And un really, unless you, there's super rich art collectors buying the work or very intelligent and, and, and excellent writers writing about the work, it's not going to get noticed. It's, it's not, you can have an art movement that's incredibly popular with artists, but it's not going to go anywhere until it becomes popular with people outside of the art world, collectors and so forth. So uh, the first show really that, that started the lowbrow movement off was called the Custom Culture Show. It was at the Laguna Beach Art Museum in 1994. Um, that was like a really big deal. It was the first time that a museum had a, a pop surrealist lowbrow art show. And it got a lot of reviews because people found it really refreshing. It was almost like it, it sprung forth, you know. It was like the birth of Venus. Where did this thing come from? Where did this art movement come from? And that kind of... Um, like lack of, well, that, that kind of questioning led to, to making the movement really popular because people could write about it. And, and that's important in the art world. Artwork needs to be written about, and needs to be explained to people who don't feel like they can understand it themselves. It was, it was hip. It was, it was a kind of artwork. Lowbrow art was hipper than color field paintings, which are basically a, color, a single color canvas, right? So you had people like Anthony Kitas of the uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Nick Cage, the actor who was buying this art. And once, you know, you hit this move, this, this moment in an art movement where collectors begin spending money, that's when galleries start to take notice, and that's when critics start to take notice. So that's basically, you know, up to a certain point, the lowbrow art movement that I was involved in followed the sort of standard development of an art movement. What made it different than the others. It, it wasn't ever completely embraced by the, what I call the fine art mafia. These are the people that run MoCA, you know, the, the blue chip galleries in Beverly Hills, and, and the collectors who are more interested in an investment than something that they really actually like. Um, what is lowbrow? My lowbrow is that um, I eschew the human figure. I think the human figure has been used in art for so long that I see no reason to use it anymore. To be truly avant-garde, one has to break completely with the past, and I don't use the human figure in my art. I use cats. So I try and get all these different aspects of what it is to be a human across uh, with cats. You know, that immediately puts me in a certain spot where I have a very limited audience because people are going to look upon my art as being cartoony, and if generally cartoons aren't looked upon as being uh, serious. You know, a cartoon is not a vehicle to really get a heavy concept across. Um, so I also found that I was doing these sort of straight-ahead paintings of cats. I was trying to duplicate moments in my life, and I would use cats instead of people, and that, that was that was interesting. You know, I, choosing my own biography as a subject. You know, it's a standard way of, of, of finding subject matter. But um, eventually I decided to start messing with the visuals a little bit more. So instead of having these straight up images that look like they were from a possible reality, I, I became very interested in, in these paintings that were sort of like neo-psychedelic in a way. A com common term for it would be abstract. I think abstract art has actually become 
psychedelic art um, because it takes, you know, as, as, like in a psychedelic experience, there's an object in the real world that somehow gets scrambled and abstracted by if it's a chemical in your head or whatever it is. Um, so I try to warp reality a little bit and, and at this point try and make objects appear right on the edge of being unrecognizable. Makes it more interesting for me, and, and I, I think that it tends to, to make the work more interesting for other people. Also, I write, and I have sort of came up with this concept of psychedelic literature in a way. You know, I tried to, to, to make a, a very uh, definite correlation between my paintings and, and what I write. So I started, and I started doing this, what I call psychedelic lit. I would take phrases that I found on the internet and spam emails. I'd build narratives up from this random text that I would find. So it was also like not exactly reality based. I, I, that's essentially the, the most succinct way I can talk about my art is it's realism that's not reality based. <laughs> now, why did I choose art? Well, you know, um, uh, I sort of came of age in the late 70s. Uh, punk rock was, was, was my youth movement at the time, but I had no musical talent whatsoever. <laughs> so I ended up hanging around with the artists, and I did actually have a modicum of, of, of draftsmanship skill. So uh, the longer I went to the University of Texas and took uh, art classes there, the better I became as an artist, and I eventually decided that I was going to choose visual art as my method of expression. The, the uh, girls in the art school were, were probably more likely to put out than the girls in the uh, ed, uh, economics classes. So that might have had something to do with it at the time. Cat Museum interview. Yeah. Well, hello there. My name is Anthony Oskang, and I'm an artist, writer, and also a musician. And I'm a, the guitar player for a band called Cat Museum. Uh, Cat Museum is an LA-based psychedelic orchestra. Uh, consists of up to nine different musicians. We tend to play to a 20-minute long soundtrack, a uh, 20-minute long movie. And we make a live soundtrack somewhat improvisational to the movie every time. We played at clubs, we played at art galleries, we played indoors and outdoors. We played for audiences that loved us. We've had members of our own band stand up and tell us to stop in the middle of the show. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, I don't feel the same kind of sense of responsibility to, to deliver the goods that I do as a painter. Of course, I still feel like I got to deliver the best performance I can, but I don't feel like um, the, the the success or failure of the universe is, is is riding on my actions like I do with my paintings. This is a lot more fun for me to do. Uh, not maybe more fun, but it's a uh, it's a whole different way of expressing myself. I always wanted to be a musician. It takes a long time to be a good musician, so I decided I'd be a musician that played instruments like no one had ever seen before. Um, the first uh, custom instrument I made was a two-bodied guitar. It had a, one neck and a body at each end of the neck. And uh, it was played it's a stereo guitar. It plays out of each body, so each, each guitar body has its own amplifier. Uh, I got the idea from that from, I believe it was a Grateful Dead or possibly it was Neil Young, who had guitars where each pickup actually had a lead that went to its own amplifier. So. Uh, you know, there, I began to realize that the more I got into music, that the, that I could be as creative and weird and otherworldly with music as I was with my paintings. And that was a great relief, in a way, because I, did, I didn't feel I had to learn the scales. I didn't have to learn musical theory. I didn't have to, to figure out what notation was or sight read. And being an experimental band is somewhat limit, uh, uh, elating and liberating, so... Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Other members of the band, we have a Victor Balach, also known as Shaggy Vic, Bill Cates, uh, voiceover artist, Jim Within, 
Matt Fielder, who makes the videos, and uh, Imelda Beach. Uh, Izzy Alive is one of them. And I think that's just about everybody that we've got in the band. Nice orchestra size. Um, what do you want to know? I don't know. What's it like uh, uh, to be a rock and roll star? The difference between like being a musician on stage and, and an artist with work on the walls is that uh, I get this sense of immediate gratification or immediate rejection from the audience. You know, at a gallery, somebody can look at a painting and decide they don't necessarily like it, and they can silently diss it and move on. You know, in a club, if somebody doesn't like the band, they uh, they can let you know it. However, if they do like the band, then they're going to stick around. So there's this this sort of like um, uh, demonstrative affection or hatred for music that one doesn't really get in art. You know, you do get that in art when people like Tony Schifrazi slash Picasso's Guernica or the guy, the, the guy who smashed uh, La Pieta uh, the, in, in, uh, in the Vatican in Rome. So, I mean, people do have violent reactions against art, but people tend to have more um, violent reactions, I think, to music than art. The days of a piece of visual art uh, causing a riot are pretty much over, I'm afraid. So is it hard working with other people? I mean, normally, you know, in, in visual arts, you're there in the studio alone. Yeah. <laughs> the hardest thing about it is that it's basically, we're called, the band is Cat Museum. It is really like herding cats. It's impossible. You get an 8 o'clock rehearsal schedule. We don't start till fucking 10.30 or 11. It takes people, people take the time to show up. You know, I do appreciate, and I still value one of the most, thing, one of the things I value the most about visual art and being a painter is I'm just relying on myself so I can, I don't have to worry about anybody else. With a band, everybody has to show up, everybody has to be ready to go, and that, that, that doesn't really happen that much. <laughs> Are you the most responsible one there? Eh... Yeah, I suppose I'm the most responsible in that I get to rehearsals if they're scheduled at 8, I get there at 8 and end up sitting in my car for half an hour. But, um... All right, so... No, everybody in the band is actually, even though it's freeform and it's improvisational, it does require rehearsals. And I would like to say that one of the reasons that we are somewhat successful is because we do rehearse. Although it's, it's like I said, freeform, improvisational, um, there's still a communication between the musicians that has to be uh, a, a nice conduit, it has to be, um, it has to function. So that's the situation when dealing with artists other than myself, dealing with a group of musicians, there has to be communication between the musicians. And that can't happen unless there's rehearsal. So we do take it seriously, although it might not appear that way to people. <laughs> what happens if you become uh, rock superstars. I mean, are you gonna? Uh, it's gonna never. Happen? It's not gonna. <laughs> it's. It'll never happen. I mean, people's brains are not wired for the, what we're doing. Huh? Gotcha. <laughs> I, I mean, people may like it in the audience. Maybe they'll buy a CD. They might get really fascinated by the visual quotient of what we're putting down. But uh, I don't see anybody uh, making out to it in a car and parked by a lake in Ohio. I don't think anybody's going to be born as a result of having listened to Cat Museum while having sex in the back seat. It's just not that kind of music, really. <laughs> it's specific to a moment in time, which is unusual. That's one of the things about music that really made me, that sets it apart from art. A painting sets, is on a wall. It has this, this temporal existence that, that, that this continues and continues and continues without end since it's painted until the thing is destroyed. Music, it's, here you go, you've got, you know, the, the two minute hit single and then it's gone. So music is, is this very transitional, transitory art form that I, I sort of appeals to me in that way. Unless somebody records a show, there's no record of it whatsoever. So what does that mean for recording? I mean, what is, uh, the recording is sort of its own event. And it, and it only speaks about that moment in time for the band, I would, I would assume, right? It's hard to say. I mean, what is a recording of, of music? Is it, a, is it recording, is the recording merely documentation of something that took place? 
or is the recording what the whole the music was done for in the first place? That that to me is is like that that's one of the conundrums about music. Is is this an actual performance or is this documentation of a performance? What's going on here? You know. It's the same like with movies. You can say a movie is is and is a documentation of a movie being made. So, um, is the artwork a documentation of the a moment of the existence of that artist? I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it is. I mean, a piece of art is proof that somebody was awake and active at a certain point in their life. You know, art, visual art, a painting on a wall is is a shout for immortality. It's a, there's the paintings when I would go to the, the Hermitage in, in St. Petersburg in Russia and look at a painting from the, thir the 14th century. Well, all of a sudden I'm transported back to a point in time in the 14th century that I would never have even thought about if it wasn't for that. So in a way, to look at an old painting is very much like time. It is as close as one can get to time travel. And to, sit, to look at a, a Bruegel painting and, and, and get an idea of the social realism, the social what was going on then. Before photography, that's the only way there was a visual record of any period of time. Mm. Right? Right on. <laughs> that's right. Anything else on Cat Museum? Well, Cat Museum is a loose affili affiliation of disenfranchised souls. Uh, you know, they kind of came together under the aegis of this, of this concept, right? So to, to provide a live improvisational soundtrack to a movie. Um, it's unusual. People aren't used to it. They, they, even we played a show with a band called the Warlocks. The Warlocks are straight up rock and drone, man. They're rock and roll. They're drone. They got it going on. The, the audience is in black leather. The chicks all have dyed, their hair is dyed black. After that, on the way out, they see us. They love it. They love it because it's completely different than what they're expecting, and it blows their minds. Whether they stick around for it or not, it's immaterial. I'd like it if they did, but if we only get them for fucking, you know, 30 seconds, and they make a decision if they like it or not, and that something's being forced, you know, we forced these people to make a decision. Nobody can really not have an opinion about the kind of music that we make. Have you ever thought of, uh, about introducing your, your visual work uh, associating with Cat Museum? Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, we just made a 20-minute long film. Matt Fielder, the, uh, the guy, who did the, the member of Cat Museum who does all the, uh, the videos, just put together a compilation of my different paintings and so forth. Um, yeah, it works really well. I enjoy it, but I also feel that this is a project that doesn't necessarily have... Um, I'm not the main attraction. When I show my paintings, everything I do with my paintings and so forth, I'm the main attraction. My artwork's the main attraction. There's a consequence, there's a hell of a lot of responsibility to do things right. And, and just being, as being a member of a, a collective called, uh, or a band, whatever you want to call it, a group of musicians working together, it's sort of, uh, it's a relief for me to not have it s revolve around myself and my artistic output. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Any fun, anything you got to say? <laughs> I can't think of anything. Um, I think we're good, man. Uh, do you have any last thoughts? So, uh, the Cat Museum, right, we've done a number of shows, and, and probably the weirdest show we did was at, at a place called the American Legion Post in Highland Park. And uh, it was actually during this show that one of the members in the band playing on stage at the time with us, stood up and began screaming for us to stop, slashing his finger across his throat, yelling for us to stop. Um, you know, really, what kind of band am I in when one of its own members screams for it to stop, you know? So um, this, this has been very interesting moments. But all the times when, when beautiful women come up to me and tell me how much they love the show, you know, what could be better than that? <laughs> it sounds like fun. It is fun. <laughs> right on. All right. And that's a cut, I guess.
Here we go. Gonna go to a, go play to a crowd of layabouts, junkies, the unemployed, <laughs> night crawlers. Museum, everybody. Yes, all of you.
filming cats. Oh, right, the Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.